Honourable Lords, ladies and gentlemen, can I extend my welcome once again on behalf of the Dean and Chapter to Westminster Abbey and to the Jerusalem Chamber uh, in particular, uh, and also to welcome you to this event, which is under the auspices of the Westminster Abbey Institute. Uh, and the purpose of the uh, Westminster Abbey Institute, which you may or may not have come across, is I think put simply, it's to enrich those in public life by a dialogue between the four great institutions that we find grouped around um, Parliament Square. The Houses of Parliament to the east, the Supreme Court to the west, all the government departments in Whitehall uh, to the north, and the Abbey here um, to the south. The square, I think, therefore, uniting the making and administering of laws, both temporal and spiritual. Therefore, the focus of our work is on those people who work around the square uh, in public life. Um, I guess we all know the, the Abbey well, a place which for over a thousand years has practised Benedictine rules of life. And these form the backdrop for our series of lectures uh, over the next month. Um, I suppose the Benedictine rules or rule of life um, a little bit like the British Constitution. Um, you think you know what it is until someone actually asks you to write it down. Um, and I'm not trying to steal any of our speakers' thunder by trying to give a synopsis of St Benedict's rules, other than to say I found two comments quite helpful. One, that St Benedict's intention was that the strong should have something for which to strive and the weak nothing from which to shrink. And the other, no one should pursue what seems better for himself but what seems better for the other instead. Now, last week, the Most Reverend, the late or former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Rowan Williams, gave the Charles Gore lecture on the staying power of Benedict in Parliament Square. So now we move on to the first of our series of lectures on the Benedictine virtue in public life of stability. And our speaker is the Reverend Canon Vernon White, who's the Canon Theologian uh, here at the Abbey. Canon Vernon, Canon Vernon has had and is still expanding a most distinguished academic and theological background and therefore is very well qualified to give this first lecture to the title Stability, Recovering the Lost Icon of Creative Fidelity. Canon Vernon. Uh, thank you for that. I have in essence a very, very simple proposal, so simple and probably uncontroversial that I'm slightly worried I'm just going to be promoting motherhood and apple pie tonight. Though, of course, that's good and that won't stop me. The proposal is this. Our personal and social life needs a measure of stability. Our current social context is intrinsically destabilising in many important respects. And in this context, what we need to recover stability is not primarily a new political program or legal framework, though that might help, but a particular disposition of character, a cast of mind. Namely, what I'm going to call the disposition of faithfulness. A largely unfashionable disposition, but I believe one which is a vital condition for any stable personal or social order. In that sense, it needs to become, again, a social icon. Uh, that is, as Rowan Williams uses the term in his book, Lost Icons. Williams doesn't actually cite faithfulness as an icon. Uh, but as you heard, or some of you may have heard last week, he certainly rates stability highly. And my point now is simply that faithfulness is a key ingredient and component of stability. Hardly a new insight. It's ancient. It's grounded deep in the origins of Western philosophy and especially in the heart of Christian theology, about which I'll say a little more later. But although it's not new, I think it is particularly critical now. So this is how the lecture will unfold. Uh, first, I'll explain why I think it's particularly important now. Second, what I actually mean by faithfulness, then illustrated in some specific areas of personal life and social order. And finally, to reassure you that this isn't just my own quirky take on life, 
a word about those deep roots in Western philosophy and Christian theology. And what you've got on your handout is roughly that order of things, if you wish to follow. First then, why do I think this is so critical now? Simply because of the intensity and the peculiar nature of change that we now experience in late modern social life. Because all the rapid interconnected changes caused by information technology, cultural globalisation, the economic drive to stimulate constant new consumer demand do not just affect us trivially. They actually destabilise us because they affect our very identity, our sense of who we are. This starts early. Children, teenagers, I have discovered over the years, are not just passively receiving the changing images of terrestrial TV, though they're doing that all right. They're interacting actively online with a multitude of other anonymous virtual bloggers, game players from anywhere in the world from whom they constantly absorb different lifestyles, different political views, different values, different prejudices, which relativise everything they've previously inherited and offer them instead a whole multitude of other possible identities to assume. This condition of liquid modernity, as sociologist Sigmund Bauman has described it, typifies not only the life now of a child and a teenager growing up, but of course it typifies adult life too. We're all exposed through various media to a torrent of options, not just about different goods to buy, that's relatively superficial, but about deeper lifestyle priorities, beliefs, values. These inevitably unsettle our settled allegiances, our settled family structures, our settled allegiances to institutions or religions, moralities. And so again, this affects our identity, our sense of who we are. It's not just that it may change us. It also changes others around us, and that is destabilising. When, for example, I find I can no longer relate to my neighbour as husband of his first wife, a teacher, a new Labour supporter, but now as partner of his new boyfriend, a software consultant, politically detached, who am I in relation to him? That changes. Multiply this with many others, and I'm destabilised in who I feel I am even more. And I don't think we should ever underestimate how disturbing this can be at the unconscious level, if not the conscious level. Not knowing who we are or who other people are in a settled way, always being on the cusp, if you like, of the unknown with ourselves or with others, evokes at some level a sense of loss, of fear, of disintegration in ourselves, and of mortality, of course. It's a cause of the high rate of stress in individuals, which we all know about. It's also a cause of strain in society generally. Family, civic, institutional life, which depends on relatively settled values, continuities, commitments, tend to crumble without them. That's why change and decay, as a famous hymn puts it, often seem to go together. Now, let me very quickly say, this isn't for one moment to suggest all change is destructive and decay around us is all we see. Emphatically not. Change, reinvention of ourselves, as I recently discovered the late David Bowie demonstrated in extreme form, can be a source of creativity, liberation, life. After all, a fixed frozen, unchanging persona in ourselves is often a sign of spiritual death. Change in ourselves often a sign of spiritual life. And society too 
can find that change is often, often progressive. It can free us from false identities which are imposed on us, the sense that we can change ourselves, become different people. That can free us from false identities imposed on us by others, by social systems which are actually quite oppressive. Social change has undoubtedly freed women from fixed roles determined by men. It's freed gay people from discrimination. Changes in education, refusing to pigeonhole the identities of children in a fixed way at, say, the age of 11, has allowed them to flourish with late development, lifelong learning. Now, that sort of fluidity is clearly positive. Seeing all change as threat also fails the test of history, the simple test of history. Rapid change happened in the past, and we didn't all disintegrate completely. As critic Frank Commode has pointed out, much of our current fluid social condition is actually just a mirror of much of the social revolutions of the late 19th century, which actually brought about great benefits. Even so, accepting that and fully accepting that, I do think we need to acknowledge a distinctive twist to the nature of change we currently experience, possibly unique, certainly unique in intensity. This is the fact that much current change we're experiencing is change without any clear direction. We don't have any clear sense of where we're heading with it, and we don't know how to interpret it. This is a function of the wider situation we're in, commonly called post-modernity or late modernity, in which we've largely lost confidence. I mean, the we here is collective, it's in society generally. We've largely lost confidence in any agreed overall story to help us deal with or interpret change. Yes, there are still, of course, overall stories in life. We can get them from science, politics, cultural theory, religion. But none on the whole commands any real overall consensus. They're fragmented by pluralism. Take a bit of one, a bit of the other. So when any new idea or experience occurs, there is no agreed, coherent story by which we can evaluate it, its meaning. Instead, we're simply left to create the meaning for ourselves. And the trouble is, purely self-chosen meanings are very often more fragile, transient, isolating. Listening to six formers, I often see this in the way they handle new ideas. In a recent discussion about genetic engineering, for example, the genetic en engineering of children, uh, those six formers that I was listening to didn't assess the issue against any overall coherent worldview they held, whether it was a religious belief about God's unique image in humanity or a scientific doctrine of the evolution of humanity. Instead, they tended to interpret it more like more like the way they would respond to a new piece of music. The moral question was reduced, in a sense, just to an individual aesthetic judgment. Do I like it? Do I like it? Does it suit my tastes? Now, briefly, it does feel like that's liberation, presumably, a liberation from moral views just imposed by tradition, thinking for yourself. But in the longer term, it's isolating, it's stressful, when major moral and existential issues are left just to us to decide. Leaving things just to our preference also makes us vulnerable, I suspect, not just to the stress of it, but to fundamentalism. The push for totalitarian certainty to then replace these confusions of our own choice. Vulnerable also uh, to any who exploit the confusion for their own purposes, whatever, whether it's religious or political ideology, or whether it's actually those who are simply manipulating our preferences just for corporate financial gain. In other words, leaving us just with personal preferences doesn't even really make us more free. It just makes us more easy prey for others. And all this 
is an effect of current forms of change and instability. I'm slightly overstating it, just to make a point. And surely, therefore, a context crying out for what I want to talk about, which is a new default social habit and personal disposition, which can at least give us some stability in our identity through change, without denying change, but giving us some stability through change. A disposition sufficiently grounded in some collective worldview to give it some staying power, more staying power than a purely personal preference, but also sufficiently flexible to survive in this plural world, which is not going away. And this, I believe, is exactly what we can and do find in the disposition of faithfulness. So that brings me to my second major point, just what is faithfulness? What do I mean by it? It was social philosopher Alistair McIntyre, maybe known to some, who gave me the clue where to go for this. Uh, and indeed, the clue where to go for it will already be in the title of the overall series. His 1981 book, After Virtue, is actually a brilliant and prescient analysis of social instability. And it's at the very end of it that he made this cryptic call for a new Benedict to save us, his exact words. A rather surprising call in a largely secular analysis to appeal to a 6th century Christian monk, but in fact entirely apposite, because Benedict in his own unstable times, the so-called Dark Ages, had in fact identified the very form of faithfulness which I believe we now need for stability. He displayed it, at least in embryo, chiefly as a rule for monastic community. Let me now try to unfold it in much wider terms with a wider remit that Benedict himself might not recognise, but I trust has some kind of connection with him. Specifically, it's what I'm going to call creative fidelity. Creative fidelity has two elements. First, it is above all, or first of all anyway, a serious, sustained, and if necessary, sacrificial commitment to the well-being of a person or institution through time, through a long narrative, not just the present moment. A wider narrative which also includes their relations with others too, not just with you or me. In other words, a commitment to the well-being of someone, some institution, some cause or enterprise in terms of their past, present, future and their relation to others, not just in relation to you or me and our well-being now. This sort of holistic fidelity is what uniquely helps give identity and stability to those people and institutions who are unstable through time and change. It also helps give identity to the one being faithful. It's a commitment, the philosopher Josiah Royce said, which unifies a life, gives it centre, fixity, stability. He uses the word. Faithfulness, in this sense, becomes a virtuous circle, replacing the vicious circle of destabilisation for all concerned. Without this sort of faithfulness, we all splinter into a thousand fragments, said Milan Kundera in his wonderful novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Lightness of Being. With it, we can all recover some solidity, some stability, some integrity. The vital second element, though, is this, and it goes back to my analysis of change. This faithfulness is not just about, not just about, being doggedly there for someone, some cause, some institution, long term. It is also about being creatively there for them, always willing to look for new ways to relate constructively within that relationship, to relate to the wider narrative of their life, 
in every sense. In other words, it's not something which is just going to lock us into an unchanging attitude, absolute rules, unyielding dogmas about the relationship. It's certainly not blind loyalty, quite different. It's a much more dynamic, even critical kind of constancy, if necessary. French Catholic philosopher Gabriel Marcel, who coined the phrase creative fidelity, which I had, it's not mine, it's his, he coined the phrase. He describes it as, I quote, no passive inertia of the soul, but a creative changing response to the presence of another person or institution who themselves are alive and changing. It actually harnesses change, even requires change in order to deal with change. A disposition, in other words, which incorporates that positive role of change, even in its attempt to re-establish much more stability at a time of change. So that's what I mean in broad and largely abstract terms about creative fidelity. What now about some examples? My third section. Where can we best apply this? Lord Williams last week uh, began to look at stability in political life. So I won't presume to add to that. I don't want to inflict either vain repetition or more likely pale imitation of what he did. There will be plenty of need to apply it to political life, of course, as always. But if I'm not going to do that particularly, perhaps I could say more about two areas which surely underlie political life and, in fact, almost all private, public, individual and institutional life. Two areas where change is certainly rife, our sense of identity certainly implicated, namely the way we order and understand our close personal relationships and the way we order and understand our working relationships and working practices. First, close personal relationships, friendship, <coughs> sexual partnerships, marriage, family life. Now, they've certainly been changing. Social patterns of kinship have always changed. Change itself is not new, certainly but not always at the present rate, and not always in what I've described as, as this rather directionless way we now experience. To back that, I'd appeal, I guess, mostly to sociologist Anthony Giddens, who's done a lot of work on this. The fundamental change now, he says, which in a sense is a new change, in all our personal relationships, even uh, family relationships, even kiss and kin, the fundamental change is a shift towards a, what he calls a more reflexive, self-referential project. What he means by that is this. We now choose, assess and fashion our relationships much more in terms of their direct impact on our own personal experience, much less as part of a wider social or public role or duty. As such, we're obviously more likely to end relationships when they do not quickly deliver that personal experience we expect and want from them. And the publicly measurable consequences are clear. There are other causes, but this will have contributed to an increase in the divorce rate, single parent families, absent fathers, non-marital births, a profusion of different forms of temporary cohabitation and a decrease in all long-term relationships. It's also had consequences for the private texture of our experience of personal relationships. This is harder to measure, obviously, but Giddens has a go. His observation is that this change has generated relationships of more intensity, more excitement, and often more instant emotional honesty. But at the same time, relationships tending to be more unstable, inward looking, and as I've said, less engaged with wider public life and public roles. <coughs> 
Now what we see in that is it's not all bad, not necessarily all bad at all. That desire for inward intensity and honesty has unlocked important the honesty in relationships. It's unfrozen some emotionally frozen past forms of fixed relationships imposed on us where there's been no emotional honesty. Fluidity in personal relationships has also, as I've already hinted, given new possibilities for gay and transgender people. And as I said before, it has meant liberation for women previously locked into oppressive relationships. And much of the literature, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, reviewing this, clearly stressed these as benefits, and they are benefits. But what we also see, documented largely since the 1980s and still being stressed, is something else, which is exactly the destabilising effects of personal stress and social damage, which is also done. That quest for short-term self-referring emotional intensity and satisfaction has meant we cut and run too quickly to find a new relationship when the satisfaction fades, rather than staying to discover possibilities of new kinds of satisfaction within an existing relationship. And that, of course, that cutting and running brings all those obvious consequences of transient relationships. If there are children, they can be damaged by the insecurity of the springs. If there are elderly dependents, they too can be neglected because they may seem unable to provide that sort of reciprocal intensity of relationship that seems to be needed. In fact, anyone of any age or gender can be damaged simply because of the pressure of high emotional expectation and the threat of transience in these sorts of relationships. To be always having to form new relationships and roles to meet these high expectations inevitably causes stress, breakdown, and that feeds yet more instability into our relationships and becomes a vicious circle. Of course, that is not a picture of all actual relationships in our late modern society, but it is a real and observable trend. And so, clearly, surely, an area in need of this disposition of creative fidelity. That is, rediscovering a disposition whose instinctive goal is not just short-term transient satisfaction for ourselves, but the much more interesting and satisfying project of sharing the long-term narrative of someone else's life and to do so creatively, not just doggedly. And it's surely a realistic, credible disposition to try and reinstate, to try and repropose in this context. Because although its over, or overall orientation to long term commitment is undoubtedly countercultural, it's not simply proposing fixed, absolute rules of relationship just stick with people, come what may. It's a creative, dynamic disposition as well, in that sense, fitting with a fluid culture as well as challenging it. One way to test it out and whether it really is realistic might be perhaps to look at hard cases. For example, can creative faithfulness even make sense in any sense in situations where there is clearly irretrievable breakdown of a relationship? Or can it make sense when relating to someone in the last stages or severe stages of dementia? when all personality seems to have changed? I think it can. And the key is precisely in the way this disposition holds us to seeing the whole narrative of someone's life, not just the present moment or even the most recent episode, whether dementia or divorce. In the case of severe dementia, creative fidelity helps maintain some form of relationship precisely by holding us to try to see the person <coughs> um, not just as they are but how they have been 
the whole narrative of their life, as they once were, and with Christian faith, perhaps, as they will be in eternity as well. In the case of losing a partner by irretrievable breakdown, it's not dissimilar. Seeing the former partner as they were, not just as they are, in the wider narrative of their other relationships too, into the future, seeing him or her not only as our former partner who is leaving us, but as the continuing father or mother of our children, the continuing friend of our friends, and so on. That will help us continue to honour the relationship in a new form. And this is not fantasy. Research by someone called Judith Stacy in the Silicon Valley in the USA, where there is widespread family breakdown of traditional forms, has suggested this is actually happening to such an extent that it's now embedded in new social patterns. People there have created new forms of loyalty to former partners by formalising patterns of communication between step-families, new social conventions of expected social interaction to which people are expected to conform. It is a way of continuing a certain kind of fidelity to a previous partner through a step-family. In 1990, a Church of England report on ageing rather gloomily said, we do not yet know what loyalty there could possibly be to step-parents. What's happening in Silicon Valley suggests there can be. It can actually take new forms. And what is key to making this all more possible, I suspect, is precisely when this sort of disposition becomes a social norm, gets embedded in a culture and a convention, not just in an individual choice, which may not be able to sustain us in difficult circumstances. I guess the church could help here, embedding it in a culture, or it can hinder. It can help not only by holding to its ideal of lifelong commitment in marriage, but also perhaps by being more willing to embrace creative fidelity in its culture, perhaps in its liturgy, when that commitment fails. I was present once at a second marriage of a friend where this did not happen. Uh, formerly, the service included absolutely no reference whatsoever to any wider narrative from the past. It was all about the present and future. And I saw the face of the teenage daughter of the groom as her own mother, the previous wife, and her own identity as her mother's daughter were therefore effectively completely written out of the script. They didn't exist. In fact, I was there to give an address, so I just had the slight chance to remedy it. I could say something briefly, just to acknowledge there was a, a wider narrative. Not entirely popular with some service, I think, but surely necessary. Any acknowledgement, even symbolic, of some form of continuing fidelity to the former partner can only help stability. It could at least prevent rancour within the new step family, at least help them stay together help stop the vicious circle of yet another splintered family. But let me move on to the second area. Can we also extend this sort of disposition realistically into our working relationships in any way, our working practices? Again, it's surely a site of real change, our working life, and of strain not least to our identity, I think. Rational managerial theory and economic drivers have seen to that. The key overall external change here, and there are many others, seems to be from settled occupations, whether in the past, mining, shipbuilding, plumbing, or settled careers in a city bank or a commercial company. The shift from settled occupations 
to portfolio work, short-term consultancy, project-based work. It won't be true of all institutions, but it will actually be a part of almost all. <coughs> and again, it's had very clear consequences, mirroring, mirroring in fact, in many ways, uh, what has been going on in our personal relationships. So on the one hand, yes, it's freed up labour, brought economic benefit to companies and personal benefits, personal benefits too, of intense uh, short-term satisfaction when you see an individual project brought to fruition. It's done all that. But on the other hand, that same fluidity has also often produced a hollowed-out work culture bereft of long-term personal loyalties and trust, undermining the worth, the satisfaction, the identity of belonging long-term to companies and institutions. So even though the rhetoric of loyalty and belonging to a team is often employed, as business analysts have realised, it's largely spurious, chiefly because the culture actually depends on so much short-term working and relationships. The 1990s brought acute awareness of this. A survey of managerial careers in 1995, for example, concluded that project-based work fluidity of employment has led, I quote, to an environment which has caused the loss of all long-term relational contracts, which implied mutual commitment and trust over the long term. A more recent Demos report showed the trend continuing. It suggests, I quote, experiencing the passion involved in achieving a particular short-term personal goal now largely replaces real loyalty to the people or institutions. And it does produce personal strain. Not just the strain of insecurity, because everything is short-term, but an even deeper rupture in personal identity, our sense of ourselves. For if this work culture means I must operate with radically different values at work and at home, if, for example, I'm basically working for short-term personal success in the former, but a long-term sharing of a life in the latter, sooner or later, I literally disintegrate with that rupture between the two. Some years ago, I remember vividly one very able city worker crumbling in front of my eyes because he was torn between different moral worlds at work and at home. Now again, this isn't a picture of all actual work experience. It really isn't, but it is an observable trend and component of it. And so again, surely, this is exactly the site, the area, to try to relearn what I will call creative fidelity. Or perhaps in this context, creative loyalty is a better phrase, a better language to use. Loyalty as a default disposition in both employer and employee, which leads them to want to recover satisfactions of long-term mutual achievement. Loyalty understood not as a disposition stifling the economic and personal advantages of change, but as a bedrock for change. Loyalty is a long-term mutual commitment which is not fossilising inertia, but provides the sort of stable personal relationships at work which actually generate more energy, purpose and confidence to critique the status quo in contrast to short-term, purely target-driven contractual relationships, which can dissipate energy, creativity, confidence to critique, simply because of the stress of insecurity. And again, this is not fantasy. Some companies and institutions do now attempt to honour <coughs> the wider narrative, what I've called the wider narrative of their workers' and members' lives by offering longer-term career progression with training so that an individual's identity and their gifts are not atomised, exploited just for the present, then cast aside, but offer continuity, harnessed to other areas of work. It really does happen. We all know that. Some employers do now honour the wider narrative of a worker's life by encouraging social engagement outside work, volunteering, wider public duty, 
so that work values and personal values of the employee are more integrated. These are already genuine new deals at work. That's the title of a recent report on managerial careers. It's how it describes them. And they offer practical structures, practical structures for creative loyalty to be exercised. One reason why I think this disposition is realistic, at work, in other relationships, anywhere, in any field, is simply because I believe it's actually wanted as well as needed. Commitment is not a dirty word for young or old, in spite of all those counter pressures of late modern consumer society with which I began, in spite of all short term, purely self satisfying instincts we may have in human nature, whether it's evolutionary or just plain sinful, in spite of all that, we do actually retain a longing for wider, deeper commitments beyond ourselves. And it's that which brings me to my very last point. This deep longing, which feeds the disposition, where does it come from ultimately? Where does its resilience come from? Can we trust it? Does it have authority? What's its ultimate source? Well, there is Benedict. Here is Benedict. Who was, as I say, appealing for stability for his community right back in the 6th century. In the instabilities of his time with just this sort of imaginative disposition. He was scathing about what he called the worst kind of monks, who were, I quote, always on the move, mere slaves to their own wills and appetites. But he was also flexible in his rule for them. In fact, that rule is very like creative fidelity in its early embryonic forms. That's what it's commending. That's what it's living. But then behind Benedict, we can go back further too. I think there may be a crucible for something like creative, creative fidelity, even way back in the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers. The tension between Heraclitus and Parmenides. Heraclitus, who saw flux, difference, change as the very stuff of all reality. Parmenides, later Plato, who saw oneness, stability, consistency as the necessary ultimate ground of everything. Perhaps it's in that ancient debate, that ancient symbiotic tension between flux and constancy, that creative fidelity has to be born as the only practical disposition which will actually work in this kind of world in which there is both, which needs both. And then finally, there's its origin, of course, in Christian revelation itself, which Benedict certainly drew on. It lies at the very heart of Christian faith and theology. It lies at the heart of it when theologians saw that tension between flux and constancy in God himself and refused the polarity of it, when they insisted that God as Trinity, as an eternal interplay of three persons but in one stable relationship, God as Trinity combines flux and stability as ultimates in his own being. Something then concretely expressed in the narratives of scripture, where this God constantly projects his identity, who he is, in the history of Israel and in the person of Christ, precisely as a God of creative fidelity, combining flux and stability. They're narratives which show who God is. I am who I am, I will be who I will be, in the way he keeps long-term covenant faith with people. Love shown through time, which is actually what faithfulness is. Love shown through time. A God who kept faith with them even in wilderness and exile with a fidelity, a constant character, wholly unlike the other capricious gods around at the time. And then in Christ, 
who kept faith even at the cost of the cross, because it could be so sacrificial, as I said at the beginning, undeterred by betrayal, deception, desertion, and death. And it's a creative fidelity that's demonstrated throughout, because in that long narrative, God shows fidelity by doing new things, not simply demonstrating an unchanging eternal essence. He is constantly doing new things. The idea of God changing and doing new things is only metaphysically worrying if it worries you at all. If we forget that in the Trinity, God can uniquely combine flux and stability. In other words, the seeds of this disposition, the roots of it, the ultimate source, really do lie deep. Right back in ancient Greek and Hebrew worldviews, and above all in the Christian synthesis of both, in the deepest sources of all Western moral social tradition. Now that, to me, lends it a bit of authority, to which I only want to add this one brief post postscript. In spite of such deep roots, as I've said, it has got lost. It has become rather a lost icon. When I looked into the intellectual history of loyalty and faithfulness in Western thought, I found it faded pretty much with the advent of liberal enlightenment, perhaps unsurprisingly. Since then, I could only find the early 20th century idealist philosopher, I've mentioned him, Josiah Royce, who'd written much about it, no one else. And who's heard of Josiah Royce until this evening? Well, perhaps you had. I hadn't until I discovered him recently. Even in theology, 20th century uh, theology, uh, the faithfulness of God had to some extent fallen out of fashion. And I suppose that fact that it seemed to fade at the onset of modernity might make us think that it's just an inevitable casualty of modernity and therefore, being realistic, irretrievable now because we are still very much enslaved by modernity. Well, I don't think so. And I don't think so because what I wonder is whether it's only really lost because of a misunderstanding and the misunderstanding is that the call to faithfulness is only and always just a reactionary call, a failure of nerve, a failure to break out of the status quo, just blind loyalty. And that, of course, would be anathema to liberalism, and probably rightly so. But what I hope to have made clear is just how wrong that is. Creative fidelity as Benedict knew well, is actually a progressive thing. It's life-giving, it's healing, it's a dynamic disposition, not reactionary at all. So I hope perhaps we can try and relearn it. Well, um, kind of my thank, thank you very much indeed for that really most thought-provoking uh, discourse. I should have said at the beginning that there will be a little bit of time, there is a bit of time now, um, for you to ask some questions or to make some <coughs> comments. I guess it would be helpful if questions were ended with a question mark, um, but if you feel obliged to make a statement, um, we're quite happy to have this as something of a conversation. But uh, a tremendous amount of food for thought there change and decay as the background, but rediscovering the lost icon of creative fidelity. The, the human bit of me, and this is not a question, um, was thinking about the United Kingdom's relationship with the European Union. Um, is this going to be transient or are we going to find a long-term relationship there? But we won't go into that tonight, but um, I think many thoughts have been stimulated. So perhaps, perhaps over to you if you want to ask a question or offer a comment. We've got um, a, a few minutes to do that. Or otherwise, we'll have a glass of wine. <laughs> While you're thinking about that, I just can't resist it. <laughs> just supposing we do divorce with Europe, 
creative fidelity suggests we've got to find continuing ways of honouring the relationship. Yes, I was, must say, I was very struck with that when you were saying that you were at a, um, a wedding and saw the former parties being whitewashed out. I can recall being at a funeral when the, the eulogy, unusually given by the widow, made no reference to her first family who were there. And a lot of us left that particular church feeling very uncomfortable. And I think you were making a very, very strong point that relationships really matter in life. Um, and they might be broken, but they've got to be restored and have, and have new context. I also, um, without sort of wittering uh, unnecessarily, um, was thinking about the loyalty uh, that comes and the contractual aspect. Um, I had 40 years working for one organisation, which I felt extraordinarily loyal to. For the last seven years, I've rushed around like a daft thing, um, rather like that sort of circus act where you have plates spinning on top of sticks, and I rush around giving lots of plates, a few sticks, and they're all contractual relationships between those plates on sticks. Actually, it's not as satisfying um, as the loyalty that comes from being part of, a, of an organisation in which you can progress, which you can make a long-term contribution. And I think you made a very powerful point there that if we get so much into portfolio careers and chopping and changing, uh, whether it's in the work life or in the personal life, I think it becomes fundamentally unsatisfying. At the end of the day, you tot up and say, well, what have I actually achieved? So you've triggered an awful lot of thoughts. Um, Thank you very much for that talk. I thought it was most interesting and stimulating. Could I ask you just to clarify one point which I thought you were partly making. Part of the culture we live in today is that we are constantly being told that we must promote our rights and protect our rights. And very little talk about our responsibilities. Immense focus on ourselves, me as it, so to speak. Uh, can you just comment on that in the context of what you've just said in your very interesting talk? Um, thank you. Uh, to which I can only agree that that's been a shift. Again, it's one of those shifts which is ambivalent because in origin, the notion of rights was a vital liberation for many people uh, and gave them dignity and its origins in the Enlightenment, like so much, were rooted in sound instinct. But of course, rights have taken over a life of their own to the exclusion of responsibility rather than being reciprocal. In terms of this whole disposition of um, what I've called fidelity or loyalty, I think it maps quite easily in a sense in both those areas uh, within personal relationships uh, it is clearly disastrous if the uh, relationship is based exclusively on rights um, which are inevitably self-referring it's part of what I was describing as the self-referring reflexive instinct we all have whereas responsibilities are instinctively other referring and interestingly, are much more likely responsibilities. You're thinking of some, your, one's responsibility to someone or some institution. Uh, to see the other, be it person or institution, what I've called holistically. That is to say, to see uh, your, one's responsibility to their whole life, not just the bit of it which is referring to me or you. So I do think that the imbalance of rights and responsibilities is pretty much at the heart of what gets in the way of what I've called creative fidelity. Yes, thank you. In, in front of you. Thank you. I'm really interested in the concept of creative loyalty from the perspective of the institution. Um, so that it sort of links with the rights and responsibilities angle, I suppose. But the, um, as an institution, many of us are probably public sector workers, um, you know, the public sector, how as an institution could it have creative loyalty to such a huge number of people and see their whole life and their whole narrative um, and, and be loyal to them uh, without then diverging into lots of different things, um, elements of their lives which may be relevant? I, 
any big employer would probably see the same um, problem that you know, the House and the Parliament, civil service departments, whatever you take as an example. How could institutions show that creative loyalty? Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I was hoping you guys who were working there would tell me, actually. Um, <laughs> but of course, it's an absolute right and fair question. Um, there are, as, as a disposition, it's general, and it's going to apply in different ways. And clearly, it will apply in different ways uh, in different contexts with personal relationships and with particular roles, um, you know, of a parent and a child, for example. Um, it seems to me there are virtually no limits, nor should there be, within that role as to how what I would call creative fidelity has to be exercised. It doesn't require any reciprocity. You know, I'll always be a father, whatever he gets up to. <laughs> That it doesn't end in any way. It's partly, it is a, an infinite um, extension, if you like, there. And you simply have to find new ways of being faithful uh, to your member of family or your close friend or whatever it is. Now, with institutions and with the workplace, the role is different. It, they're not family members and it apply, uh, clearly applies differently. And there is a sense in which one should not, could not and should not expect uh, to exercise a kind of responsibility to someone's whole life as an employee in the same way that one would as a parent or something like that. So, of course, it's different. Uh, how? Nonetheless, I do think it applies. I think there are aspects of it uh, which do apply. And I, I take my, um, my conf confidence from that, partly from some of the, the work that I was citing, which wasn't specifically about public service institutions, but about big corporations and corporate life. And the ways in which they have systematically, some, uh, um, inst some companies, anyway, some corporations, have systematically reviewed the number of short-term working practices, project-based work that they have been using, reviewed it and changed it. And not completely, and that is one way, in other words, Loyalty in terms of giving a longer trajectory, a longer narrative to any one employee and actually finding the, uh, the payback is quite considerable, interestingly. Uh, but also in that other way I suggested, which is, for whatever reason, I mean, it's good PR, I know, but why not? If it's good PR and it's also a good moral disposition, let's have the two together if they happen to go together. The way that um, uh, they have made space for the personal values of the employee to be given expression in things like social engagement, giving work time over to make available projects of social engagement. Now, it happens, and it's happening in the most competitive um, of corporate life. How this might map onto public service employees around here and the institutions may have aspects of both those. There may be imaginative ways, which I certainly am unaware of, I would simply urge that that's, if you like, the, the trajectory, the, uh, uh, the gold standard, to try and find ways of extending the narrative with an employer in both directions, both in time and, if you like, in, 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 in their whole being and their whole life. Um, so it's not so hollowed out, so contractual. But exactly how, in your context, over to you. Another intervention from over here, behind. Uh, with regard to Richard's question, 20 years ago or so, John Hapgood uh, gave a lecture in the Abbey entitled, Do Too Many Rights Make a Wrong? And I think that answers the question. <laughs> Looking at the macro side of what you were saying, uh, I think it was uh, internationally. Last year, we celebrated three very important international anniversaries of the end of the war and the start of the United Nations and of course the, the burgeoning of the Commonwealth and such as my antiquity that I was involved in all of them. And I detected last year a very strong latent, act, uh, uh, um, inactive, passive rather than active loyalty to these collective identities which you're talking about. But the question is, I think, have they to be interpreted in the 21st century in international rather than national terms? 
Thank you. Um, and that is exactly for the diplomats to, uh, uh, to answer. No, it's a very, very, very fair question, of course. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just struck by some of the, um, which I think bears on your question, some of the inevitable rhetoric we are hearing and we're going to be hearing uh, surrounding the referendum campaign, for example, uh, which, if it went one way, would probably provoke another referendum about Scottish Union again. But some of the rhetoric we have heard in these areas and will hear, um, I think has been, if you like, too um, one-dimensional in its expressions of either loyalty to a particular relationship or disloyalty, if you like. Um, that is to say, uh, the, uh, the proposal to leave a relationship. It's been too one-dimensional in the sense that there has been very little room left for continuing a relationship if it cannot be continued under the same terms for various reasons, circumstances that it had before. Uh, it is too black and white, too either or. There's too little attempt to see the relationship precisely as a relationship, even in international terms, in which people's loyalties and sense of self collectively are caught up. And therefore, the idea of a complete rupture or, if you like, a complete uh, uh, unchanged partnership, neither actually is likely to do justice to what is needed if we have a, a presumption of creative fidelity, even in international relationships, we shall always be looking for ways to continue the relationship, new ways, even if they're different ways. And that the heart of it is not to make it too one-dimensional. It is to see that the relationships have various layers, various depths, which can creatively be maintained, changed and improved. Um, if we reduce the rhetoric just, uh, although the vote has to be reduced to this, to in out, if we reduce the rhetoric to that, we are actually going to do violence for the future and lay out more instability for ourselves beyond the actual result of any referendum or the actual renegotiation of any trade deal uh, in international relations more widely. And my um, mentor, if you like, in that kind of third way, which was always looking for more creative ways to maintain relationships, is someone that in last year's lectures I use as a kind of lodestar, uh, which is the, the work of the first Secretary General of the United Nations, Doug Hammarskjöld, and the way in which he creatively always found ways, tried to find ways, of continuing relationships in different dimensions, even when circumstances were changing and whether you wanted the particular outcome or not. That was what was key. And that was international relations. Uh, it was actually extending what is true in personal relationships into that ar arena and finding it worked more than one might expect. Um, one in the front. <clears throat> Thanks, Vernon. I'd like to pick up a point you mentioned just now, just a very small point about divorce. You know, if this person does not meet up to my expectation, then the relationship breaks down. I mean, in a very simple way, isn't it much more a person's sense of who he or she is and the search for the real person? So if that is never really reached to a certain degree, it will continually crumble in relationships, in work, and at all other levels. And if I'm right, I'm not a Benedictine, I'm a Franciscan, but I suppose in today's religious contemplative congregations, one of the reasons for stability is that there's no escape, in a positive sense, from searching for the real person, because we are here with this group of people for life. And probably that could be one of the dimensions of Benedict way, way back in his time. Can you say something about that and how that can be seen in today's world? Um, thank you. I I can try, uh, because there's a huge amount there. I'm sure in any relationship at, at a, between two people or between a person and even an institution, um, there is a combination, if you like, when the relationship goes wrong, 
of something which is happening within that relationship which seems to impede either or both parties from being their true selves, as they see it anyway. I'm sure that's a, an ingredient, a very powerful ingredient in it. Um, I know, uh, I guess we all know, that there are times when that damage to each self is so great within that relationship that even when everything has been tried to change the terms of it creatively within the relationship, the damage is so great that the relationship has to end in any significant sense that it once had divorce. I'm also convinced that the true self of both parties will only ever be fulfilled if in some way each can nonetheless continue to honour the other in some way in a different form after that formal relationship has ended. In other words, there is in the end, and there cannot be, any absolute and final um, disjunction or contradiction between my true self and the good of the other person. They're, they have to be both held to. And if, in fact, finding my true self has no regard at all and cannot feel any further regard for the good of the other, then it's not your true self you're finding. I hope that's an answer. We've got time just for one more intervention. Um, in fact, you, I think you've just answered a question that has been forming in my mind, which is whether there are any limits to creative fidelity. And um, would you, your answer seems to be no, uh, if I understand you correctly, but would you not think this an argument that at least needed rejecting, if you're going to reject it, that where a rupture is, in any kind of relationship, is the active response and the, uh, the justified response to the gravest form of wrongdoing, that um, there is no, um, well, there is no room. I mean, that's when creative fidelity runs out. I mean, how creative can you be in such a situation? And there are real contexts of these kinds of ruptures, you know, abuse of parents, children, and things like that. Um, <coughs> do you not, is there always and everywhere the same duty on um, all persons to effectively forgive, as I should say? Um, uh, even the most serious form of wrongdoing. Um, I couldn't possibly make a judgment about every situation and make it an absolute judgment. I think all I'd want to say is that I believe that there is a presumption that we always try to find some way of continuing to honour the good of the other person, even when they have done us appalling wrong. The good of the other person, of course, at its depths, if it is really a wrong, might mean uh, something very hard for them, but it's ultimately for their well-being. There is a presumption that we try, and if we fail to forgive because we're human, the extraordinary thing about the Christian narrative, the long-term Christian narrative, and God's faithfulness to us, is that we are all forgiven and we're forgiven when we're not perfect. But we're carried by that narrative, at least to try. Well, thank you. Um, I sense we could probably go on for quite some time, but I'm under orders that we shouldn't, so we won't. But um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a glass of wine. Um, can I, on behalf of all of us here, um, thank Callum Werner for his absolutely fascinating talk. I think the analysis that you've given and the framework which you have provided gives a lot of food, food for thought in our personal lives, our professional lives. And I'm sorry, we, I, we did touch on the referendum and then you took, took the bait a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I think that what you've laid out for us has so many applications that there's a tremendous amount for us to draw on and, and think about. And uh, undoubtedly St. Benedict, when he thought about these things 1,500, 1,600 years ago,
Um, these were enduring thoughts and we can benefit from that. And thank you for your analysis and thank you for your application tonight. Um, we've been extraordinarily, extraordinarily privileged and thank you for those who've asked questions for your contribution as well. And there's a glass of wine. Can I, thank you. <laughs>